So today I want to do two things. First is a question that uh, one of the students asked me that I probably need to explain this whole separability thing. Are there fields, field extensions that are not separable? Or is separable, separability something you get for free? Yeah, since what we did, I think our base field was called F, and then <clears throat> we made a Galois extension by taking the splitting field of some polynomial split over F of a polynomial small f, which was a polynomial with coefficients in f. You can do that for any field, and if you take separable polynomials, you get separable extensions, meaning that the roots of the polynomial are distinct, and what you get here is then a separable extension. We've also seen that even if the polynomial is not separable, because it's x minus 2 cubed, for instance, then yeah, you just join 2, and it's still a separable extension. So you can wonder. Can it be if you take f, say, irreducible, yeah, that's one of the standard cases, f irreducible, will it automatically be separable? So can you think of a separable polynomial, sorry, an irreducible polynomial, which has multiple roots? And if you think in characteristic zero, that never happens. And why is that? Because you learn that f has a multiple root in some extension, then that multiple root is also root of the derivative. Multiple root alpha, that implies that the derivative in alpha is zero. And if you're f irreducible, then you see that if it's also irreducible, it means that the GCD of f and f prime, they're not co-prime, yeah, since they have a common root. It means that it is not one. And if your f is irreducible, well, the GCD of f and f prime is in particular a divisor of f. And if f is irreducible and the divisor is not one, meaning not a unit, up to a constant, being it has to be equal to f. So if f is irreducible and not separable, then you see that this GCD is going to be a non-trivial divisor of f. But the thing is irreducible. So it actually has to be equal to f. And can the GCD of f and f prime be equal to f? And you think, no, of course that cannot happen, because the derivative has a lower degree than f has, so it cannot be f. Or can it be? Can you think of a polynomial for which f divides the derivative? Is that possible? We've almost proved that irreducible polynomials are automatically separable. Or is there still a slight catch? Sorry? Constant polynomial. What happens for a constant polynomial? Actually, of course, it's not what we want because we want to join roots, right? And it was irreducible. Is a constant polynomial irreducible? Ha, ah, it's a matter of definition. <laughs> what did you learn back home about constant polynomials? Were they irreducible? Depends on the definition, right? We just have to agree on what the definition is. If you do ring theory, you define irreducible elements more in general, right? And constant polynomials, except for a zero polynomial in such a ring fx, are the units. Are units irreducible in rings? This is a bit like the question, uh, is one a prime number? Ultimately, that's a, a choice you make for a definition, right? And people made this choice in most cases for you. And one is not a prime number. Why not? If you say a number is prime, if and only if it only has one and itself as divisors, say positive divisors, then one becomes prime. If you say a representation is irreducible if the only sub-representations are V itself and the zero representation, then the zero representation becomes irreducible. Is it? Actually, Rene is not here, I think, so we actually forgot to say that it should not be zero. For the, yeah? the zero representation is not irreducible. One is not a prime number. Constant polynomials, in a field at least, are not irreducible. 
Okay, so it's not a constant polynomial, so that doesn't happen. Now we need a different example. Or we prove it doesn't happen. In characteristic zero, if the polynomial f has degree n, then the polynomial f prime will have degree n minus one. And you know that the polynomial degree n will not divide the polynomial degree n minus one, right? And if you multiply polynomials, degrees add up. So if you're at n, you cannot get back to n minus one. But there is something that might happen. Maybe the degree of this polynomial is not n minus one. It com completely disappears. It could be zero. And that happens if you work in characteristic P. In characteristic zero, it never happens. Then the degree n becomes n minus one, because if you start with something times x to the n, you get n times n to the x minus one, right? But if n is divisible by the characteristic, then the whole thing disappears. So you see that if the characteristic of f is zero, then every irreducible f in the polynomial ring is separable, which means that in characteristic zero, you never encounter the world inseparable. However, if it's equal to p, then f, if you take an f which is of the form, um, let me write in a slightly different way, if you take a polynomial with the property that f of x only involves powers x to the p, yeah, for some polynomial g in fx, has derivative f prime identically equal to zero. That's because if you have x to the p or x to the kp, if you take its derivative, it disappears. Others survive, but that's the only way you can get derivative zero. And if you now work over a finite field, say fp, yeah, if you take a polynomial in fpx, and if this polynomial f of x is of this form, can it be irreducible? For instance, take p equal to 5, then take x to the 5 minus 2. Can that be irreducible in f5x? What do you think? Does it have a root? is to a fifth power. Two is the fifth power of itself. In fp, if you raise to the power of p, you get the thing itself, right? Then you see that what you get is just x minus two to the five. In other words, if your ground field f has the property that everything is a pth power, yeah, then you just write this sum ai x to the ip, whatever. Yeah, that's what your polynomial looks like. And now the question is, are, yeah, if all these ais are actually p powers of something, itself or whatever, then you just write it as sum vi x to the i to the p. Remember, raising to the power p in characteristic p, you can just do it termwise. Yeah, there's no binomium. Well, there is, but there's no middle terms. So the question is, can you have a field of characteristic p that has elements that are not p powers? If that happens, you can create irreducible polynomials that are indeed inseparable. So can we think of a field in characteristic p that has the property that not all elements are p powers? And if you take a finite field, it's not going to work. A finite field in characteristic p, it will be fp to the n, 
And then you know that there is Frobenius, from, which sends x to x to the p. It's not a morphism. In particular, it's surjective. So everything is a pth power. So you should not work with finite fields. So we're looking for fields and characteristic p, they're very special, in which not all elements are pth powers. Well, if fp doesn't work, and something algebraic over fp is also wrong, because it's a finite field, then you take something, an extension of fp, which is not algebraic, meaning that you take it transcendental. So if, you're, if you take the field f, p, some transcendental, that's just the function field of the line, if you want. It's just, this is what you get. The field of fractions is f over g with f and g in fpx, g non-zero. Yeah, and you have your, you know the polynomial ring with coefficients in fp, that's a, an integral domain, and you can take its field of fractions, that's a field. So rational functions with coefficients in fp. And this is a field in which not every element is a pth power. If you take a polynomial or a rational function, doesn't really matter, and you raise it to the power p, then you get a polynomial in t to the p. So if you take t itself, that will not be a pth power of something. Which means that the polynomial x to the p, so, this is my, so I take my ground field f equal to this field. And now I look at the polynomial x to the p minus t in fx. So I'm, I'm trying to adjoin a pth root of this transcendental t. And the question is, is this irreducible? It doesn't have a root, since you see that t is not a pth power. So how would it factor? Yeah, and you can look at the splitting field. If this is my f, I can form a splitting field over f of this funny polynomial, this one. And what do I get? It has a root, and I have to give it a name. Well, you can call it alpha, or maybe t to the 1 over p, or p root of t, or whatever your favorite notation is. Let me call it t to the 1 over p. So this is an element, by definition, if you raise it to the power p, you get t. That is one root of the polynomial. And now you're used to characteristic zero. If you have one p root, you get more by multiplying by p roots of unity. And p roots of unity, that is something we've looked at yesterday or whatever it was, you get them by factoring x to the p minus one. The roots of this polynomial are the p roots of unity. But in characteristic p, there are no p roots of unity except for one. Yeah, so that polynomial has only a Simple root has only one root, which is, has multi multiplicity p. So there is only one element, which is a pth root, which is one itself. So you cannot create more roots of this polynomial than this one. In other words, if you take this, the pth power, that is the factorization. So this is an irreducible polynomial, and its roots, there's only one root with multiplicity p. So it's irreducible. And here you see it's inseparable because all its roots coincide. So it's an irreducible, inseparable polynomial. And you say, okay, well, it's certainly, if you, so this field extension is fp t to the 1 over p. It has degree p, and it's a splitting field. So, you say, okay, why would it be a problem that it's inseparable? It is not a problem. It's only a problem if you want to do Gelder theory. So if you want to do Galois theory, then you're going to look at the group of automorphism. That's your tool, your handle to study this extension. If this is my field K, what is the group, automorphism group of K that are the identity of F? That is the group we use in Galois theory. And that should give us all the information. In this case, you would hope that it has order P. That's what happens in the normal situation if you have separable extensions. What do you think? What is this automorphism group? Yeah. 
We have an automorphism of k, which is the identity on f. Then the only thing you can do is say what, yeah, you have to de determine what happens to this root, this t to the 1 over p. And its p power is t. That is to be left invariant. So you have to send it to something for which the p power is t. But there's only one element for which the p power is t, namely this element. There's no choice. There is no automorphism except for the identity. So this group is the trivial group. It only consists of the identity of the field k. So you don't get a Galois group, or you get a trivial group. And this is the simplest example, but it shows that for inseparable extensions, there is no automorphism you can play with. So there is no Galois theory. And that makes the word a little bit strange. So for instance, let me give you another example. If you do the same thing in two variables, so if you take f, p, t, and u, and you would join both p roots, p roots, f, p, t, 1 over p, u, 1 over p, that will also be inseparable of degree p squared. So this extension is an inseparable extension of degree p squared. And again, there's no Galois group, no more. And that has consequences that you may not be aware of. You're used to, if you want to create a finite extension over Q, for instance, you can always make it from Q alpha. But my claim is, whatever alpha you choose in this field, K will never be F alpha. For all alpha in K. In other words, this extension cannot be generated with one element. It's not a primitive extension. In characteristic, in characteristic zero, all finite extensions are, are primitive. And why is this? Well, if you take any polynomial or rational function in this field and you raise it to the power p, what happens? You replace all t1 over p and u1 over by t and u. In other words, if you have an alpha in k, and you take its pth power, you end up in f. So any alpha in this extension of degree p square has the property that its pth power is in the ground field. So there's always a polynomial of degree at most p of which it is a root. So it will never generate a full extension. So you see these are accidents that happen in acceptable extensions. And then it's a matter of taste whether you like these. Yeah, they feel a little bit exotic or you hate them because they don't behave the way they should. And it's all a matter of taste, since you may say that these things are actually much nicer, in the sense that by extracting roots in inseparable cases, that is a great thing. It's always unique. And many errors are made in characteristic zero by people who use root size. Yeah, most people, I've done this in Holland, example, if you ask people, what is the eighth root of 16? Now, no, you're not from Leiden, but what is the eighth root of 16? Is this the same thing as the square root of 2? Is actually the question. Yes or no? You should know that 16 is 2 to the 4, right? And if you take 2 to the 4, you take an 8th root, you get 2 to the 4 over 8, which is square root 2. Sounds good. So most people say yes. And they say, well, we are actually, this is actually true because 16 is indeed the 8th power of square root 2. So that finishes the proof that this is correct. But other people will say that if you take a different element, which is not even real, square root of minus 2, and you raise it to the power 8, you also get 16. And q square root 2 and q square root minus 2, that's quite different. And people who like Gaussian integers in qi, they will say, well, if you take 1 plus i, and you raise it to the power 8, yeah, you need to square it three times. If you do it once, you get 2i. If you do it twice, you get minus 4. And if you do it three times, you get 16. So there's many elements for which the eighth power equals 16. And if you just call them 8 root of 16, then you have an element which you can't even say in which field it lies. Is it real? Is it in q square root 2? Is it q square root minus 2? Is it actually a Gaussian integer? We don't know. So 
root notations, especially in this case, are just to be avoided. Okay, this is uh, general nonsense, uh, and actually I wasn't planning to do this, because I got these questions over lunch, and I think this is useful to know. So this is the inseparable uh, world, which is different in many ways, no primitive elements, no automorphisms, but also, yeah, no errors, so whatever you want. Okay, this was just some kind of appendix to uh, the main theorem of finite Galois theory, the restriction on Galois extensions, so maybe that's a, to conclude with, the statement is that Galois extensions, the way most people define them, F K finite Galois. That is exactly the same thing as saying that F over K is finite, separable, and normal. Well, finite because we do finite Galois theory. Separable means that for every element in K. If you look at its irreducible polynomial over f, it has distinct roots. You can separate the roots. And that is good if you want to do Galois theory, because then you can always write such an, that's a theorem actually, in this situation. <coughs> this implies that k is f alpha for some alpha in K. So there's a primitive element for the extension. Not conversely, this is also a primitive extension, but it's inseparable, so it's not Galois. <coughs> Another way to look at this is saying that this is that K is the splitting field over K, sorry, over F of some separable F separable f in fx. So these are finite Galois extensions, and the word separable always has to be there, but in characteristic zero, characteristic zero you can forget about it, and also if the characteristic is p and you're dealing with finite fields. In fact, the problems only occur if you have fields that are not perfect. So the word perfect, if you want to know what that is, you call it the field K or F is perfect. It just means no accidents and the definition, definition is either the characteristic of F is zero or the characteristic is P, but then you want that F is F to the P. So the set of pth powers, x to the p with x in f, is just the full field. Everything in f is a pth power. So perfect fields include critics zero fields and finite fields. And there's certainly need for imperfect ground fields. If you want to do geometry over finite fields, which many people do in arithmetic geometry, this happens all the time. And being inseparable is just part of life. So you do want to know what it is anyway. Okay, then for the final part, the question is, <coughs> what if we want to erase the word finite? What are infinite Galois extensions? And of course the question is, would you want to look at infinite Galois extensions? You say, why would we need them? Maybe you say, I don't want them, so let's forget about it. But sometimes you discover that it is convenient to work with more canonical objects. So if you start with your favorite ground field, I don't know what your favorite ground field is. I guess there's two kinds of people, the characteristic zero people who say Q is my favorite ground field, at least in algebra. And there's the characteristic P people who say, well, finite fields are so easy that my favorite ground field is FP. Mm -hmm. 
And we can actually make both people happy. Since for any field, you can take the maximal algebraic extension called the algebra algebraic closure. You probably know that, right? You can just sort of take a union if you want. You have to be a little bit careful, but every field has an algebraic closure. And you can just give it a name. So you can create Q bar. And some people like to create it inside the complex numbers. Namely, then you just take all complex numbers with the property that they are algebraic over Q, meaning that there exists a polynomial f in Qx, not identically equal to 0, obviously, with the property that f of alpha is 0. This is just to say that this alpha is algebraic. So it gives it a very concrete feel, this Q bar. This is the algebraic closure of Q. And that's where all algebraic number, algebraic number theory takes place, for instance. And this is an extension which is separable, and that is normal, because yeah, that's defined in terms of elements having certain properties. It's only, it's, it's not finite, it's infinite. So the question is, if I look at this group, the automorphism group, well, anything will be the identity of Q, but let me put it here for a This group, what is it? And can, what can we use it for? This is the absolute Galois group of Q. And maybe you should be interested in Galois extensions. You could say, well, if you can understand and describe this group, then probably all finite extensions, you just get them by taking quotients of this big group. So maybe just for once we compute this group, whatever it means, and if you know what it is, then all the rest follows from one result. Would be ideal, right? And in fact, that is something that people really like to do. But the disadvantage, of course, this group is fairly complicated. So to study it, you have to use all kinds of tricks and you don't get an easy description of that group. If you do the same thing for FP, then there is the field, let me call it FP bar. That's the algebraic, algebraic closure. And if you want, you can sort of view it as a union of all finite fields. Yeah, you can, for every deg finite degree n, there is a unique subfield, FP to the n, which consists of those elements in FP bar that are roots of x to the p to the n minus x. So alpha to the p to the n minus alpha <coughs> equals zero. So that's just a set of roots of a polynomial of degree p to the n. You want to help? <laughs> ah, I think we're going to do the writing. <laughs> Thank you. And what would the automorphism group of FP bar over FP B. Maybe that's easier to describe. So on a finite level, we know quite a lot. Namely, what is the Galois group of FP to the N over FP? It's a thing we computed already. It is generated by Frobenius, Frob P, which was the element that raises to the power P, and it has order N on this field. Yeah, you see, if you apply it N times, then you get exactly the elements left invariant that are in that field. So what would an automorphism of FP bar look like? Can you describe it in terms of the Frobenius? So you see that if you're in this in anything finite, you know, if you take your favorite element in FP bar, it will generate a finite extension, and then the automorphism will just raise to some power of P, it will be power of Frobenius. So maybe you would think every automorphism here is just the power of Frobenius. So question mark. Is this 
just an infinite cyclic group generated by Frobenius. And if that were true, you would think, OK, that uh, looks good. Since then we have Galois theory again, namely subgroups of Z, they look like NZ, that will correspond to FP to the N. And if you mod it out, you get Z mod NZ, which is the Galois group, exactly what you want. Would be nice. But as it happens, I'm going to explain why in a moment, this is not true. There are many more morphisms. Of course, it will be contained, but it will certainly be different. So the Galois group, the infinite Galois group, can be a little bit more complicated. And sometimes it's so complicated that you don't know how to describe it at all. This group has no explicit description that I know of. There's all, all kinds of ways to study it. And typically, you study the group by making it act on things, roots of unity or torsion points of uh, elliptic curves, whatever you can find in the world to understand it. Yeah, there's people that do Galois representations. That's the word to use here. Yeah, you take your favorite set of things on which you have an action of GQ, and that gives you lots of information on GQ you get all kinds of quotients. But you don't easily get the group itself. And many questions that are easy to state are still open. For instance, can you find an extension of Q with any finite Galois group? Is every finite group a Galois group over Q? That's called the inverse problem of Galois theory, which is still open in its full generality. Most groups we can do, but it's not proved that every group can be done. So open problems are already here sort of, well, within reach. And you need to know a lot of math if you well, get further here. So let's say you want to erase the word, the word finite. You might do it here as well. And you need a context in which you can still do Galois theory. And there will be problems, as we will see, because groups can turn out to be more complicated. And another thing, if I stick to finite extensions, then everything becomes algebraic. But if you have infinite extensions, yeah, you can also look at the extension from FP, or maybe in the, I mean on the left, maybe a Q. I could just adjoin a transcendental QT. That's also an infinite extension. is not, not algebraic. And you can think of all automorphisms, and there's lots of choice what you can do with T. So exercise, think of this automorphism group. What is it like? And, and the problem is that this T is, is not algebraic, so you can replace T by T plus 1. That's automorphism, but also by T plus 2 or T plus something. There's infinitely many choices already for one element. So that also sort of breaks what you typically do in Galois theory. So the, true, the good definition is that it should be algebraic, which is something you should now require, separable and normal. And in this context, you can do Galois theory. But it looks a little bit more complicated. And what you need to do is introduce topology to get the right theory. And in a way, there isn't much that you actually do you derive everything from finite Galois theory. Yeah, since if you take your favorite ground field F, Q, or this finite field, doesn't matter. Suppose I want to describe the automorphism group that I just erased. So this is the, so GF, the absolute Galois group, consists of all the morphisms of the algebraic closure that are the identity on F. So that is, and Anything which is algebraic, separable, and normal, well, if you really want to be very general, you can say inside here you can look at what people call the separable closure, all elements that are actually have a separable irreducible polynomial. And then here you want to do Galois theory. F sep consists of all elements in F bar for which alpha is separable over F, meaning that its irreducible polynomial has distinct roots. And if you work with perfect fields, then F sep is just the same thing as the algebraic closure. So you have is for F perfect. 
So I'm fine if you just stick to perfect fields and then you think about the algebraic closure rather than the separable closure. So maybe I want to look at this one and let me just assume for now that F is perfect. It is just the set of the group of all automorphisms of F bar over F. What does certain, such an automorphism look like? Yeah, this is the group I want to study, and then I want to derive what the main theorem for Galois theory should look like. Yeah, the bijection between subfields and subgroups that probably exists, but maybe in a slightly different way, is what we want to know. To define any automorphism on F bar, sigma, you just need to say what it does on every finite Galois extension. Since this F bar is the union of all finite Galois extensions inside F bar. So if for any finite K in here, I was, I was assuming that SEP was just the whole thing, right? So perfect fields. There we go. If I, I can define my sigma just by saying what it does on every separate Galois extension, so this is a finite Galois, finite Galois. If I say how it restricts to every finite Galois extension, I'm done. Because every element in F bar is algebraic, so it lives in the finite Galois extension. So to, to study this group, you view it as a subgroup of the groups that you do know. So you take all the Galois groups of the finite Galois extensions, and you just combine them in one big group. You take the product over all extensions k of f that are finite Galois. Finite Galois. So in this case, where you have the finite field fp, you see that this group, So that's the absolute Galois group of FP is going to be embedded in the product of all these groups. So the Galois group of FP, the absolute Galois group, will be embedded in the product of all, well, and here you know exactly what the finite extensions are. There's one for every n. So there's a product, n is one to infinity, and for every n there is a finite Galois group of FP to the n over FP, which is a group that we actually know. So this is the product of all Z mod N Z's. And the only thing you need to realize to say what this Galois group is, is if I take an element here, when will it actually define an element of this homomorphism group? Since clearly, if you have two finite Galois extensions, K1 and K2, with an inclusion, K1 and K2, then if you want to define this sigma by giving the action on every finite level, if you define what it does on K2, then you know already what it does on K1. So you can no longer say what it does here. That has to follow from the thing on the bigger field. So in this big group, you need a subgroup where all these sigmas that you choose here are either chosen in a compatible way. And what does that mean? It means that whenever, so image here, yes, it's a subgroup. Image is the subgroup consisting of well, let me just phrase it informally, compatible choices. I mean that, and that means exactly what I said. If I have K1 and K2 with an inclusion, like I have on the, on the board there, in such a situation, there is a restriction map from the big Galois group to the small one. So then the Galois group of K2 over F subjects to the Galois group of K1 over F. And if I take an element in here, so for every k, I choose an element sigma k, 
then such an element will only define an actual automorphism if for every inclusion, K1 and K2, sigma K2, if you take the natural map, the restriction map, you restrict to K1, then you should get the element sigma K1. So this is not a very deep statement. It just says that you can glue all sigmas, to, all sigmas together if you choose them in a compatible way. Meaning that you can define on every finite Gelbach extension your favorite way, just pick an element of this finite group, but do it in such a way that under restrictions, the big one restricts to the small one. So in this case, it means that This Galba group consists of elements A mod N, yeah, so an element in here. You get an A N, an integer mod N for every, for every N. That's, yeah, that's an element of the product here. And you want, if there's an inclusion, so if M divides N, meaning that FP to the N is the bigger one, containing FP to the M, then if you take the big one, a n, and you take it modulo the smaller one, mod m, you get a m. And one way to do this is just pick your favorite integer and just, just take everywhere a mod n. That is certainly compatible. And that just means that I look at the subgroup that I just erased, which is just Z. But there's many more choices. For instance, I can take a power of Frobenius that doesn't seem to make sense. Let me give you an example. So in the absolute Galois group of Fp, there is this element from P, which raises to the power of P. Let me call it sigma, just to make life a little bit easier. So I have my canonical choice of the Frobenius. Then any power is also an automorphism. But I claim that there are also powers that I can define with non-integers. For instance, if I do one, plus two factorial, plus three factorial, plus four factorial. That looks like a non-integer, right? Since you're used to, maybe I, if you want, I can put a factorial here as well. So the question is, this doesn't look like it is an ordinary integer, right? It doesn't appear to be in Z. But still, it makes sense to apply this to any alpha in FP bar. If I pick my favorite alpha in FP bar, and I want to apply this huge exponent, that doesn't seem to make sense. What does it mean? Well, it's a product, right? It means that you take. You take sigma alpha times sigma to the two factorial. Uh, yeah, I should say. Let me try to say it in a different way. Why does it make sense? Any alpha in FP bar is contained in some finite field FP to the n, by definition. And that means that if I apply Frobenius to it to an exponent divisible by n, it doesn't do anything on alpha. So that means if your alpha is in fp to the n, then you only need to go up to n factorial and the rest doesn't matter anymore. In other words, this integer is not an integer. It's not defined as an integer, but it is defined modulo n. Namely, so one factorial plus two factorial, I should have erased it, I guess mod n 
makes sense for any m. Namely, if you want to compute this mod n, then you see as, long, as soon as you reach n factorial, you get zeros, and all the rest is zeros, so you can stop. So this non-integer does have a value mod n for every m. And these are actually the elements in the absolute Galois group that are non-integral powers of Frobenius that still exist. So you get a bigger group. And now my time is up, so next time I will actually complete this story. And what you get is a group in this big product, this, these compatible choices. Yeah, so you just have to formalize what it means. This is compatible choice, it just has a name. In here, we give it a definition. And the definition is called the projective limit. I will say in more detail what it means. This group becomes the projective limit over all k of all these Galois groups. So you make the absolute Galois group in terms of all the finite Galois groups. And it's just that subgroup of the full product that consists of those compatible choices. And this thing, the projective limit, that is the concept that I cannot define in detail now. It says exactly that you should pick the elements here in a compatible way. And next time we'll see that this group has an interesting topology. And why is that? In the final minute, finite groups have no interesting topology. They're just discrete, right? But if you take an infinite product of finite sets, there is a topology. Finite, group, finite sets have a discrete topology, but an infinite product of them is no longer discrete. Since what are the opens? Well, you can fix finitely many coordinates, and then the rest you have to leave free. That's the definition of the product topology. So you see every open is going to be infinite, if these are at least uh, non-trivial groups. So this is, in fact, a, this is a group which has non-trivial topology. And next time we'll see that this subgroup, which is a closed subgroup, it's something compact. You may have heard about Tikhonov, right? Finite sets are compact with discrete topology, and infinite products of compact sets are compact. So this is a compact group, and this is a closed subgroup, which is then also compact. So now the topology is going to do the work for you, and we'll see next time that the, the main theorem of Galois theory says that you do get a bijection between subgroups and intermediate fields, but you have to restrict to closed subgroups. So if you take the group or its closure, you get the same invariant field. To be explained next time.